Welcome to Peace in Focus. Egypt and Cyprus are united by the Mediterranean Sea and share the common goal of maintaining peace and stability in the region. This beautiful island is known as the land of Aphrodite, the ancient Greek goddess of love and beauty. Aphrodite's Egyptian counterpart, Hathor, was also worshipped here. From the island of Cyprus, which Mark Antony gave to Cleopatra as a gift, an expression of his deep love, and from this very special place where Aphrodite is said to have appeared from the sea. Thank you for joining Peace in Focus. I'm Mona Swelan. Aphrodite is the goddess of the eastern Mediterranean island of Cyprus. Greek mythology has it that she was born at Petra Turmiou, near the coast of Paphos, a city in southwestern Cyprus, about 130 kilometers from the capital Nicosia. The myth says that Gaia, the earth, asked one of her sons to mutilate his father, Uranus, the sky. Cronus cut off his father's genitals and threw them into the sea. Aphrodite rose from the resulting sea foam or Aphros. It is said that a person who swims around Aphrodite's rock that marks the birthplace of the ancient goddess will be blessed with eternal beauty. The ancient Egyptian sky goddess of love, beauty, motherhood, joy, music, foreign lands and mining, Hathor, was also worshipped in Cyprus, where she was identified with Aphrodite. <music> Geographical closeness has led to long historical ties between Egypt and Cyprus. It has laid the foundations for dialogue between civilizations and promoted cultural intermingling between Egyptians and Cypriots. The Cypriots love Egypt. In fact, the whole world loves Egypt. It takes about 50 minutes to fly from Cairo to Larnaca International Airport. Cyprus covers an area of some 9,250 square kilometers, with a population estimated at about 950,000. Cyprus has beautiful beaches and offers excellent services. Egypt is also a major tourist destination but has much more to offer, and I don't think that this TV program will have enough time to list Egypt's touristic attractions. Many Cypriots lived in Egypt and have deep roots there. They love traveling to Egypt, especially Alexandria, where they have a church there. There are good Mediterranean cruise trips, and the Egypt Air office in Cyprus gives cheap deals during high season. The number of Cypriot tourists traveling to Egypt is certainly much more than the number of Egyptian tourists visiting Cyprus. Peace in Focus also spoke to Poppy, a Greek Cypriot who was born in Cairo. Poppy left Egypt in 1973 and has been working as a tourist guide in Cyprus. I was born in Egypt and I never forget Egypt. I love Egyptian tourists. Unfortunately, I don't have enough opportunities to practice my Arabic in Cyprus. I studied Arabic and I can read and write, and I also watch Arabic language TV channels and I love Egypt so much. I was born in Cairo and I left Egypt after finishing school in 1973 and since then I have been working as a tourist guide in Cyprus. Egyptians and Cypriots have a lot in common. We cherish close family ties and we are known for our hospitality. We also look alike and have similar features. We love the sea, nature and food. Do you cook Mr. A in Cyprus? We don't have fulam tamaya and we bring this delicious dish from Egypt. We have a delicious aubergine recipe that tastes just like Mr. A. 
Greek Cypriots who lived in Egypt at one point gather every now and then and prepare Egyptian food, but of course it is not the same taste. We cook molochia soup, but without rabbits. We cook rice, but not with the special butter that Egyptians use. My aunts and mum used to prepare such tasty dishes back in Egypt. We can buy molochia in Cyprus, but I don't know how to cook it. There are also restaurants that sell full and tamea, but it is not the same taste. <laughs> Some of the ancient copper mines on the northern slopes of the Trodos Mountains still exist today. Cyprus was the major supplier of copper in the ancient Mediterranean. The word copper is derived from the ancient Roman name of the island of Cyprus. Aphrodite represented copper in mythology and alchemy because of its enduring value and beauty and its association with Cyprus. The ancient Egyptians used the Ankh the symbol denoting eternal life as the sign for the precious metal. The ancient Amarna letters or clay tablets affirm the strong Egypt-Cyprus diplomatic ties dating back to the late Bronze Age or the 14th century BCE. In a letter addressing Egypt's 18th dynasty pharaoh Akhenaten, the king of Alassia, or ancient Cyprus, refers to 500 talents, about 12.5 tons of copper. The king makes excuses for sending small quantities of copper to Akhenaten, blaming it on Nergal, the Mesopotamian god of war and plague. My brother, behold, my messenger I have sent with your messenger to you to Egypt. Now I have sent 500 talents of copper to you. I have sent it to you as a gift for my brother. Do not let my brother be concerned that the amount of copper is too little, for in my land the hand of Nergal, my lord, has killed all the men of my land, and so there is not a single copper worker. Therefore, do not let my brother be concerned. Send your messenger along with my messenger quickly, and all the copper that you desire, I will send you, my brother. You are my brother. You should send me silver, my brother, a great quantity. Give me the best silver, then I will send you, my brother, all that you, my brother, request. As a strategic location, Cyprus was occupied by several major powers, including the Assyrians, ancient Egyptians and Persians, from whom the island was seized in 333 BCE by Alexander the Great. Cyprus was subsequently ruled by the Ptolemies, Romans, Byzantines, Arab Caliphs, French Lusignan and Venetians. The following conquest in 1571 ushered in the beginning of more than three centuries of Ottoman rule. Cyprus was placed under British administration in 1878 until it was granted independence in 1960. The 26th dynasty pharaoh Ahmose II conquered Cyprus in 570 BCE. The period of Egyptian domination left its mark mainly on sculpture, characterized by rigidity and the Egyptian-style dress. Cypriot artists later adopted Greek prototypes. A rich collection of seals and coins are on display at the Archaeological Museum of Nicosia. This is a coin depicting Alexander the Great, whose policy on Cyprus and its kings was to free them from Persian rule, but to put them under his own authority. Alexander sought to make clear that he considered himself the master of the island. He abolished the currencies of the Cypriot kingdoms, replacing them by the minting of his own coins. The 
This is a coin depicting the famous Ptolemaic dynasty queen, Cleopatra VII, the last pharaoh of ancient Egypt. The Ptolemaic kingdom was established by Ptolemy I following the death of Alexander the Great in 332 BCE. Ptolemy I declared himself pharaoh of Egypt and created a powerful Hellenistic dynasty that ruled an area stretching from southern Syria to present-day Libya and south to Nubia, a vast empire that included Cyprus. Alexandria became the capital city and a center of Greek culture and trade. The donations of Alexandria a religious and political statement by Cleopatra VII and Mark Antony in 34 BCE indicate how Antony gave Cleopatra and her children lands held by Rome and Parthia, a region of northeastern Iran. During the festivities, Antony affirmed Cleopatra as Queen of Egypt, Cyprus, Libya and central Syria. The donations of Alexandria caused a fatal breach in Antony's relations with Rome and were among the causes of the final war of the Roman Republic. The civil war was fought between Octavian's forces and the combined forces of Cleopatra and Mark Antony, her lover and ally. The naval battle of Actium in 31 BCE was the decisive confrontation. The Ptolemaic rule in Egypt ended with the death of Cleopatra VII and the Roman conquest in 30 BCE. Diplomatic relations between Egypt and Cyprus were established in modern times soon after Cyprus gained its independence in 1960. Ambassador Ahmad Raghib thinks that such ties have gone through three periods. The first was the historical stage. The second stage related to Egypt-Cyprus relations is well known and historic. It is when late President Gamal Abdel Nasser and Cypriot President Archbishop Makarios III established the Non-Aligned Movement in cooperation with other leaders in 1961. That period witnessed very strong Egypt-Cyprus relations and Egypt spared no effort in helping Cyprus attain its independence in 1960. The third period is the stage that we are experiencing today and after the Republic of Cyprus joined the European Union in 2004. Cyprus is a neighboring country and there is strong bilateral cooperation. Cyprus supports Egypt in the European Union and the Palestinian cause. Egypt also supports resolving the Cyprus problem based on UN Security Council resolutions and international law. There are many bilateral agreements that have lately been implemented. It is useless to have agreements that remain ink on paper. Egypt, uh, I have to say, is uh, the best ambassador for Cyprus uh, uh, in the Arab world in general. And it looks like Cyprus is the best ambassador for Egypt in the European Union. Uh, I think that it would not be an exaggeration to say that uh, Cyprus is the best friend of, e of Egypt uh, within the European Union. We support uh, uh, very warmly the development between uh, the uh, relations uh, between Brussels and Cairo. Uh, we are very active in uh, taking initiatives within the European Union to bring Egypt and the European Union closer together. And of course, uh, now within the Union for the Mediterranean, which is a vehicle created by the European Union to cooperate closely with the countries of the Mediterranean basin, uh, I think this is uh, another, offers another sphere of cooperation.
Mascara is a unique village located on the southern slopes of the Trodos Mountains, about 35 kilometers away from the capital Nicosia. It's in the Larnaca district of Cyprus, off the main Nicosia-Limassol highway. This beautiful village, with around 1,100 inhabitants, takes its name from the white of its silica and limestone. The name Lefkara is derived from a combination of the Greek words Lefka, meaning white, and Ori, meaning mountains. Lefkara is famous for its lace, known as Lefkaretika, and silver handicrafts. A common sight is women sitting in the narrow and cobbled streets, working on their fine embroidery, as they have for centuries. Peace and Focus visited a Lefkaritika shop that dates back to 1969. I have the uh, embroidery shop here, and uh, we. Since when? Since 1979. 1979. 1979. 1979. Yeah. 1969. 1969. Yes. That's a long time. Yes. Uh, it used to be my father's job. My father used to be merchant of this in England from 1929. Mm. He first been to Milano, and then he been to England to sell with the uh, by suitcases, you know, in the by house to house. Has he ever been to Egypt? To Egypt by bit three times, but only for tourists. For tourists, not yes. selling? Not selling, yes. So what's the story of Lefkaritika? Lefkaritika is the name of the work they make here, and we work only on linen. It used to be Cyprus linen, because Cyprus used to produce uh, linen uh, in the beginning of the century, of last century up to 1930 and then we find the Irish linen which is much more beautiful the weaving of the linen is much more easier for the women to work and they stop to grow any more linen in Cyprus and, uh, left and cotton you use mostly Egyptian cotton really yes so you, uh, you import we import yes and uh, I understand that uh, Lefkaritika or your lace that you produce is protected by UNESCO Yes, the last uh, few years, the town hall here uh, start to make some uh, movements to be recognized by UNESCO, and they we had a big success. Are you going to like uh, have a, a European Union trademark one day? In the uh, we Union? hope so. We hope so. Yes, my shop now is the only one approved by European Union. We don't sell machine or China or uh, whatever, and uh, from now and on they put uh, our. Uh, uh, embroidery in any new guidebook. Mm. They have to put uh, our shop actually. It is said that Leonardo da Vinci visited Lefkara in 1481 and purchased a lace cloth for the main altar of the Duomo di Milano the Cathedral Church of Milan in Italy. The Lefkaretika style was probably imported to the village from Assyria. Much later, the Venetians took it home and set up their own lace industry on the island of Burano. So yeah. what's, what's the story of, uh, uh, of the lace that was taken by Leonardo da Vinci? Uh, it's the oldest day we have to say that they start to make 4081. The story say that da Vinci visited Lefkara and uh, he saw, or other people say they, he buy. I say that he saw, and after goes back to Milano. What did he, he see? He, he saw how the women make and after goes back to Milano and paint the Last Supper with Lefkara embroidery work on the, on the cloth. In that time, Lefka, uh, Cyprus was under Venus, you know. And uh, after goes back to Milano and paint in Santa Maria della Grazia, the Last Supper, 
which is the most famous painted uh, of Leonardo da Vinci. And this happened, as I say, 1981. Uh, 1986, it was the anniversary of 600 years for the time they built Duomo Church in Italy. And the authority of the church came to, the, uh, to Cyprus, and they came to Lefkara, and they asked to make a new cloth. And I designed it, and I took it there uh, with the measure. It is it's a cloth which is 5 meter 57 by 2 to 2 and a half width, you know, and took seven months for three ladies to make it. And it's the same pattern? It's the same pattern, yes. What do you call it? Do you have a special name for the pattern? We call it Leonardo da Vinci pattern or Potamos. It's the zigzag uh, work. It's the most beautiful, the most historical, the most complicated work. Thank but unfortunately, die. The old women die, the young they don't make, so. It's, di it's a dying It's a dying industry, yes. Very, very, and it's a cottage industry. We don't pay women by our, we give, we design, we give the piece in the house, and when they finish, we pay the amount of the work, not the time they spend. I understand that at one point in the 18th century, Lefkara uh, was, people living in Lefkara used to go to, uh, to Egypt to sell yes, their stuff. In the big, the first uh, people goes abroad, it was actually a lady, and goes to Egypt, to Alexandria to sell embroidery. This is what the story, the books say, you know. And after they go all over the world, you know, even uh, they used to go to Russia. I remember people in the village, they speak all the European language, even Russia. Because before the war, you know, they used to go to St. Petersburg or to Moscow to sell embroidery. Thank you so much. Thank My you. pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's beautiful. Aphrodite Cyprus is not just about picturesque villages, legends, love and beauty, the sun and the sea. The small island with an area of about 9,250 square kilometers is highly militarized. Cyprus is also partitioned into the Republic of Cyprus, whose de jure sovereignty over the entire island is internationally recognized, and the de facto Turkish Republic of Northern Cyprus, the TRNC, that has gained diplomatic recognition only from Turkey. Nicosia is physically divided. It's the capital of the Republic of Cyprus, but its northern part functions as the capital of the TRNC, that achieved self-declared independence in 1983. As part of confidence-building measures, seven crossing points have opened since 2003 with the objective of allowing free flow of Cypriots and tourists between the south and north. These crossing points, the only positive thing they are doing is just uh, giving us a chance to go to the other side, to cross to each side. But as it seems, it is uh, actually making the, the separation of the two peoples of Cyprus uh, more confirmed, more affirmed. Uh, it's making it worse because when the Turkish Cypriots are treated badly here, they feel upset and they start to feel, have bad feelings against the Greek Cypriots. And when Greek Cypriots go to the other side and they are treated the same, they, uh, they ask them to show their ideas, they also feel upset and they also start to feel hatred again. And they don't understand that this is not the fault of the people of Cyprus, this is the fault of the authorities. The occupation forces, if they want to, if they want the people to show ID cards, it's not our fault. And I believe the Cyprus authorities here, when they want to, when they want us to show their, our ID cards, it's not the fault of the Greek Cypriot people. We are good friends. We are the children of the same land, and most of us will love each other. We have very good relations. But our authorities on both sides are doing their best to keep us separated. I think there is nothing positive. It's just a pity. It's just a pity. It's the first time I tried to pass from here with my wife, 
And uh, over there it says that uh, in my country to pass there I have to show my passport and my ID because I enter into the Republic of uh, North Cyprus. It's a pity. This is not uh, Republic of North Cyprus. This is Cyprus. I love Turkish Cypriots, but this is Cyprus. I, c I don't accept it, so I didn't enter. So, I mean, uh, you think that the problem is with the authorities, not the people then? The problem is with politicians, it's not with people. And uh, if politicians, they think that by this way they solve the problem, then our president and some other people, they have to think again and uh, they have to decide and tell the truth to, the, to, our, to our people. Is this a solution they want to give? We don't need it. You've just uh, crossed uh, from the Greek Cypriot side. Uh, what do you think of this? I've just come now, so I have no idea what I'm thinking here. I'm just going to see what's going to be here in this case. You know, all I know is that last divided capital in the world, so I have to see what exactly it means here. So uh, do you have any problems on this side uh, with your paper or anything? I don't have anything on me right now. I just came from the guys over there. They won't stop anything to me. You don't have a passport or anything? No. Not for me. I mean, they just asked you where you come from and they left you to go? That's right, yes. The Cyprus problem remains one of the long-lasting unresolved issues of the international community. The United Nations Peacekeeping Force in Cyprus, Amphisip, assumed its mandate in 1964 and is still operating here. According to the Amphisip website, a UN buffer zone was established following a failed 1974 Greek Cypriot coup d'etat and a subsequent Turkish military intervention. The buffer zone stretches approximately 180 kilometers across the island and is interrupted by areas not controlled or monitored by Amphisip. A de facto ceasefire has held since 1974. The mandate given to us by the Security Council has remained the same since 1964, which is to prevent the fighting, uh, to allow a return of normal conditions as far as possible, and to create a climate that will allow um, peace negotiations, peace talks uh, to take place and to succeed, ultimately, we hope. So why uh, was there fighting in 1974 when your mandate in 1964 was to avoid any uh, fighting, to prevent any fighting? Well, they were fighting because they were of the conditions uh, in the island at the time. There was, uh, as you may know, in 1974, uh, an attempted coup uh, in the Republic of Cyprus um, to replace uh, the president uh, uh, of the Republic of Cyprus, uh, Archbishop Makarios, uh, and that prompted an intervention uh, from uh, the Turkish forces, uh, and th then there was fighting between, between the two sides at that point. Uh, I think there was a peace process uh, even before then, there were attempts by the United Nations, the international community, to prevent a recurrence of fighting. Obviously, that was not uh, done in 1974 because there was fighting, as you rightly point out. Uh, but we have been uh, trying since 1964 and especially since 1974 to try to bring the sides together and to finally reach a comprehensive settlement to this issue, which has been going on for at least the United Nations involvement in it for f almost 50 years now. The problem of missing, enclaved and internally displaced Cypriots lingers on. Protests continue to be held calling on the European Union to commit itself to its 2004 pledge to lift the embargo of the Turkish Cypriots living in the TRNC. The EU promise was made after the Turkish Cypriots said yes to the 2004 UN-sponsored peace plan known as the Annan Plan that was rejected by the Greek Cypriots. The Greek Cypriots have never forgotten the tourist area of Varosha in the city of Famagusta in northeastern Cyprus that has been deserted since 1974 and has become a Mediterranean ghost town. These are some of the issues related to the Cyprus problem. One problem with peacekeeping missions is that they may contribute to a status quo. In other words, the Greek Cypriots and the Turkish Cypriots may have gotten used to the fact that Antisip is here, keeping the peace since 1964, and maybe this is why they are not really exerting the needed effort to resolve the Cyprus problem. Is this what's actually happening? 
That's a very important question, and it's one that we ask ourselves <laughs> uh, a lot, in fact. Uh, there, there is that risk, there is that possibility, of course. But you also have to uh, measure that against the fact that you still have uh, opposing forces here, that there is still potential conflict um, uh, breaking out again uh, at some point. Uh, the fact that we've been here, I think, has prevented that conflict. <laughs>said that during the Ottoman Empire, Ottoman flagged ships would hang their flags at half-mast when off the shores of Larnaca to salute Hala Sultan Teke with cannon shots.